Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Now at 5 o'clock, homicide in Farmington Hills. We'll hear from the fiancé who is inside the house when the shots were fired. All right, Sean, in the dark, some Metro Detroiters are preparing for a weekend without power. But we are going to begin right now at 5 with a severe thunderstorm warning. It is in effect right now. Let's get right over to Andrew at the top here at 5. What are you seeing on Storm Tracker 4, Andrew? Well, Kimberly and Karen, we're looking at Storm Tracker 4 showing severe thunderstorm activity farther to the south of Detroit. As you can see, down here in parts of uh, Monroe County, the southeastern corner of Monroe County, in fact, southern Monroe County, including the city of, the, of Monroe, under a severe thunderstorm warning. That warning is in effect still until 515. Here, let me zoom in a little bit closer because this has dangerous lightning, a heavy amount of rain in these areas of purple. That's where the rain is the heaviest, even the possibility of some small hail just here south of uh, Lambertville. You can also see heavy rain draped here in red from LaSalle over to Erie, just about to strike the folks over in Luna Pier within the next five minutes. In addition to this heavy rain, in addition to the lightning, it also has winds of 60 miles per hour or greater, which can be damaging. Best place to be is indoors. Let these thunderstorms pass and then it gets calmer and calmer for the rest of the evening and tonight. We'll talk more about that and your full weather forecast. Once again, severe thunderstorm warning for central and southern Monroe County until 515. All right, thank you, Andrew. Our other top story this Friday, COVID's comeback, a concerning rise in the number of new cases, 3,127 3, in the past two days. That averages out to about 1,500 new cases a day. Also, the number of deaths from COVID crossed the 20,000 mark with 29 new deaths being reported. And you can clearly see the trend right here. Three weeks ago on July 30th, we were averaging 573 cases per day. Fast forward to today, and that number is now more than 1,200. And as those numbers rise, state health officials issued new guidance today, strongly recommending universal mask wearing in schools. Let's get to Grant Herms. He's live tonight. Grant, this is still just a recommendation, not a mandate, right? That's right, Kimberly Karen. That we're likely not going to see a mandate. The governor is saying she would only urge school districts to mask up universally. So this is the strongest recommendation we're going to see. And that means that it's left state uh, school districts and counties to piece together their own plans. The state health department issuing its strongest recommendation yet for the new school year, calling for universal masking, saying in its announcement, because many students have yet to be vaccinated and students under age 12 are not yet eligible, layered prevention measures, including universal masking, must be put in place for consistent in-person learning to keep kids, staff, and families safe. That advice comes amid a new surge of the Delta variant, now 99% of cases in Michigan, and just a few weeks before students are set to head back to class. The Michigan chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics also recommending everyone over the age of two mask alert. Uh, kids can really adapt to mask wearing. But school districts have put together a patchwork of mask mandates without a state one in place. According to an analysis from Local 4 and Click on Detroit, just 10 of 56 districts have put in place mask mandates. Looking at what's going on and what we recommend moving forward, that that can be taken as we would take an order. So far, not a single health department in Metro Detroit has mandated masks. And just this week, Genesee County becoming the first in the state to require universal masking. The rest caught between the white hot political anger over masks and sound medical advice. Unfortunately, a lot of the misinformation or pushback that's happening, uh, we can't afford to keep entertaining. And local health departments told me today that even if they put in those mandates or requirements or whatever you wanted to call them, they likely wouldn't do much good. It would also divide their already limited resources between enforcement and things that they really should be doing, like contact tracing and getting people vaccinated. They're just hoping that people take these recommendations as seriously as they're meant as they're giving them out.
back to you. Indeed, okay, Grant, thank you. And progress is being made on vaccinations. As of today, 64.4% of Michigan adults have received at least one vaccine dose. Meanwhile, this afternoon, the CDC's vaccine advisory panel voted unanimously to allow immune compromised people to get a third dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. And this was the next required step after the FDA expanded the emergency use authorization for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines late last night. The meeting also revealed much more about who will qualify for an additional dose. 11 yeses, zero noes, uh, and the ayes have it, and the recommendation is adopted. The independent panel of experts in total agreement that some immune compromised people may benefit from a third dose of an mRNA vaccine. That includes those being actively treated for cancer, organ and stem cell transplant recipients, those with immunodeficiency syndromes, advanced or untreated HIV, or taking immune suppressing medications. The intent of this is to limit this to uh, individuals for which um, are considered under the UA, EUA to be moderate or severe. And so, for example, would not include long-term care facility residents or persons with diabetes, um, uh, persons with uh, heart disease. But shots will be given on the honor system. We are not recommending that uh, either prescriptions or a physician sign off be necessary for individuals uh, to receive uh, an additional dose of mRNA if they're immunocompromised. The third dose would be given at least 28 days after the second dose. It's recommended to get the same vaccine received previously if possible. This change does not include those who got the J&J &J vaccine because of a lack of data. The FDA is working on a solution for those patients, and the panel stressed a third dose still won't adequately protect some who are immune compromised. I think the reality is they'll be safer, but still at an incredibly high risk for severe disease and death. Um, and so I think there needs to be a, a fair amount of counseling and education that goes into this effort. Now, the experts cautioned immune compromised people still need to be cautious and recommend surrounding themselves with vaccinated people. The CDC director still needs to officially sign off on this change, and that is expected to happen quickly. Crews have made major progress, but there's still a long way to go. Right now, 225,000 DTE customers are without power following Wednesday's storms. I want you to take a look at this, the DTE outage map. You can see the progress that has been made, but the company says it could take until early next week to get all of the lights back on. And that means a lot of folks are going to be spending this weekend in the dark with no AC. It's yeah. going to get a little sticky. Indeed, and that includes pockets of Royal Oak on that outage map. Our Tim Pamplin is there live tonight. Tim, there's still a lot of damage there. There is an awful lot of damage in Royal Oak here as we look at this tree. Two days later, tree down, crushing a car, bringing down power lines. Now a DTE safety crew has just arrived on the scene here, that gentleman there. He's securing this area. Uh, DTE are gonna tackle these outages on a priority basis. Take a listen. Then we start to look at the most number of customers affected on a circuit. There can be a circuit that has 10 customers out. We can have another one that has 4,000 customers out. Well, restoring 4,000 is where we're gonna go first. So you can get the biggest numbers the fastest to get everybody back in back in power. Yes, it's all about prioritizing. As we look at the DT outage map, let's zoom in up towards Howell, just north of M59 there, that big red splotch. As we uh, click on that, we get the data. Just over 2,500 customers out of power. Restoration by tonight, 11.30. Now, if we just go to the south of M59, one of those green splotches there, click on that, 128 customers. They may have to wait until Monday evening. So back out here, you see the safety crews putting up the caution tape. This intersection here at Knowles and Forth going to be shut down. Uh, this is a, a, one of the green splotches here. 128 customers without power here. Again, Monday evening when they anticipate this. So it is going to be a long, hot and sticky weekend across southeast Michigan. Back to you guys in the studio. Oh, we appreciate those workers doing all that overtime. Mm -hmm. Well, the muggy weather going to be clearing out just in time for really a huge sports night in downtown Detroit. It is. How long has it been since we've said <laughs> that? The Lions are taking on the Bills in their first preseason game at Ford Field. And right next door at Comerica Park, Miguel Cabrera is going to be swinging for his 500th home run. Jamie Edmonds is live there tonight ahead of all the fun and excitement. Hi, Jamie. 
Hi there, Karen and Kimberly. The atmosphere downtown is pretty amazing. Fans of both the Tigers and the Lions coming downtown, flooding the streets, and yes, it's been a long time since we've said that. The doors to Ford Field just opened. There were huge lines of Lions fans. Dan Campbell has reinvigorated this fan base, and so has the new regime. They don't care that it's a preseason game. They want to see a Lions win. Really cool atmosphere in that the Lions have shut down Brush Street. There are food trucks. There's music. There's games for the kids. There's a zip line down Adams. Switching gears to the Tigers right across the street. I have seen so many Miguel Cabrera T-shirts, Miguel Cabrera signs. Fans want nothing more than to have him hit home run number 500 in front of this home crowd. I talked to the biggest Tigers fan I've met in a long time earlier, and he already has a plan if it happens tonight. But if I have to, I'll run all the way to right field, and I will grab that ball, and people probably, like, people will probably want money for that baseball, but I would give it back to them. You I, give it to them. If you get the ball, you're giving it to Miggy. Why? Because... I am. I feel like if you don't give it back, you're a horrible person, <laughs> like respectfully. I mean, how cool is 12 year old Ben? He would give that ball right to Mickey. If you see them waving, he's been standing in line there. He's trying to be the very first one allowed in Comerica Park. So you got Tigers Indians tonight. You got Bills and Lions also tonight. Coming up in sports, we're going to hear from both AJ Hinch and Dan Camel about this big night. Adding to the excitement, Dave Chappelle is in town at the Fillmore. Oh, it's also wow. the Dave Chappelle testing site. <laughs> so we got a lot of people going on down here. That's Guys, right. back to you. And 12-year-old oh. Ben has certainly given this a lot of thought, too, in terms of what he would do if, with that ball if he got it. So definitely en enjoyed that he report, He absolutely too. has. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jamie. <laughs> well, tonight we get a first-hand look at what DTU, DTE crews are up against. New tonight, we're tagging along with restoration crews to see what their job is like as they rush to get the lights back on. And another weekend of road construction closures is upon us, and there's one project that could catch you off guard. Sean. Murder mystery here in Farmington Hills. A man was shot through his front door, and he was shot and killed. His fiance was in the house at the time. She tells us what she saw. 